welcome everyone to day two of the 2023 Grad Futures Forum Grad Student Professional Development Conference hosted by the Graduate School at Princeton University. My name is Eva Kubu and I'm the Associate Dean for Professional Development and Director of Grad Futures. We're delighted you could join us for the fourth year of this annual conference designed to support graduate student futures at Princeton and beyond. Since the launch of Grad Futures in fall of 2019, the Graduate School has continued to expand its commitment to professional development. Grad Futures now serves as a hub for empowering Princeton graduate student futures through a broad spectrum of skills training, mentorship, bespoke experiential opportunities, and interdisciplinary exploration. We created this annual conference to both advance the professional development of our own graduate students and to serve graduate communities beyond Princeton by opening up the conference to other institutions. Each each year, registrations continue to pour in from across the country and around the globe, a testament to the imperative of investing in comprehensive professional development to empower the next generation of scholars, researchers, entrepreneurs, and leaders. Many thanks to my amazing Grad Futures colleagues and our graduate student professional development associates, and to our Dean, Rodney Priestley, for his strong support of professional development and the Grad Futures Initiative, as well as our dedicated graduate alumni partners, campus partners, expert speakers, and industry partners, without whom this conference would not be possible. Over the course of the next five days of the conference, there will be more than 20 unique sessions and 40 speakers and panelists, all focused on supporting graduate students through programs that prepare them with clarity, competencies, connections, and most most of all, the confidence they need now and in the future. The theme of this year's forum is advancing innovation, equity, and inclusion via professional development. And when it comes to advancing innovation, graduate students are at the heart of innovation at Princeton. Each and every day, they're at the forefront of creating new knowledge and accelerating discovery. And many are considering entrepreneurial options and becoming founders. In fact, a growing number of startups are em emerging from universities and research institutes around the country. Young enterprises that are accelerating innovation and changing the game in entrepreneurship and in every field imaginable. At Princeton, we're very fortunate to have a robust innovation and entrepreneurship ecosystem that connects graduate students, postdocs, alumni, faculty, venture capitalists, and industry. The Grad Futures competency model includes innovation and entrepreneurship as one of our core competencies for all graduate students to focus on as part of their professional development. We offer many workshops, seminars, and experiential boot camps in partnership with Princeton Innovation, the Princeton Entrepreneur Council, our NSF i Hub, the Keller Center, the Office of Technology Transfer, and many, many alums. This afternoon session will be led by Princeton alums Jim Cohen and Mark Pogue, Managing Directors of Fitzgate Ventures. For the past five years, Mark and Jim have facilitated our venture capital and startups learning cohort, which serves as a crash course for graduate students interested in understanding the world of VC funding and startups. We're delighted that they can share their expertise with our Grad Futures Forum audience today. Welcome, Jim and Mark. Thank you, Eva. Pleased to be here. We, we really enjoy uh, all the work we do with you and James and Grad Futures. Uh, so today we're gonna start, uh, I'll start off, I think there'll be sort of three broad categories of what we're going to cover. Uh, first, I'll just give everybody a little background on our firm. Then Mark is gonna kind of walk everybody through the financing of the startup and sources of capital. And then the third part of the presentation is gonna be what you need to really include in a pitch deck if you're an entrepreneur. So three big categories. We're covering a ton of stuff. We're going to unfortunately have to move pretty quickly, but hopefully at a high level, it'll give everybody some good background. And then if there's time at the end, we're going to reserve uh, maybe a few minutes for a couple of questions. Uh, so Mark, if you could advance the next slide. So just a little background on Fitzgate. Uh, Mark and I formed the firm in 2015, closed our first fund in 2016, 
Uh, we're investing out of our second fund right now. We are an early stage venture capital firm, which means that we invest in the pre-seed and seed stage, so the earliest stages. Uh, we've got about 40 million uh, under management. Uh, we do have fortunate enough right now to have top quartile returns. We've been very successful with the model, uh, in large part due to the network that includes a lot of Princetonians who help us along the way. Um, our minimum check size is $500,000. Uh, we typically uh, co-invest with other investors in seed rounds, which are typically two to $4 million in size. We've led about a third of our deals. Um, and often we, in maybe a quarter of our deals, we've gone alone where it's been a tech transfer opportunity. We do love tech transfer and have done a couple of deals out of Princeton, um, one out of Yale, UCLA, a couple of other places. Um, we currently have 20 portfolio companies and we are generalists. So we will invest in any vertical, anything from quantum computing uh, to a direct consumer company. So we're really open. Most of the companies we back tend to be software um, and tech enabled largely because when you're investing as a venture capitalist, you're looking for something that can scale quickly and generate venture style returns. Um, as far as Mark and me, we do, we've really enjoyed teaching this cohort at the Princeton Grad School. That's been a lot of fun. Um, we also, we both live in Houston, so we teach a class at the Rice Business School uh, about venture capital investing, teaching students basically how to think like a venture capitalist. We're mentors to tech stars, NYC. That's fun. They have huge cohorts coming through several times a year. Uh, the Princeton Entrepreneurship Council, the eLab Advisory Committee, um, and we're also on the Dean for Research Advisory Council at Princeton uh, and mentors at the Rice University Lilly Lab. Uh, next slide, Mark. So just by background, uh, not to bore anybody, but my background has been mostly in, uh, Mark and I both started out as lawyers, uh, but then I quickly turned to investing and Mark quickly turned to being a software entrepreneur himself uh, before it was fashionable. So he... Uh, <laughs> it was a while ago, and uh, it's really interesting to see the the history of how things have evolved. But uh, so, Jim, uh, are you are you calling me old? <laughs> <laughs> you did it the hard way. Um, but uh, I think our background's been very complimentary, and it's been uh, very effective. Uh, next slide. So one of the ways that we leverage, you know, we are a two person, we're, we're, there are two GPs in our firm, Mark and me. Uh, we have a couple of interns, always one from Princeton, always one from Rice. But really the way we leverage our own abilities is through this Friends of Fits network. And basically it's a group of people who are neither paid nor necessarily investors in our fund, but who, for whatever reason, experientially want to be a part and advise and help sort of look at new opportunities. And uh, it's a combination of faculty, administrators, uh, largely from Princeton, alumni who are either venture capitalists or successful founders. And we found this group to be um, very helpful to us, not only in terms of sending us deal flow, but also helping us vet deals as to which ones are the most uh, potentially successful. And then once we've invested in a company, uh, we tap into this network to help our, our founders uh, when they have questions, when they're raising capital, um, and when they need mentorship generally. Uh, next slide, Mark. So here are a few of the folks I'm not going to go through, but you know everybody's sort of from Jen Rexford, who's now the new provost at Princeton, uh, which is really exciting, uh, to Melinda Lewison, who uh, heads up uh, Jeff Bezos's uh, family office. And uh, well, we've actually referred a few deals their way. They've invested in a couple of our uh, portfolio companies. And um, you know, a lot of this is through the Princeton network. And it and I just encourage everybody to no matter what school you go to, tap into your alumni network. It's an incredible resource. Uh, next slide, Mark. And just a few things that people are saying, nice things about us. Uh certainly uh I guess I'd say in the case of our quantum computing deal out of Yale, we were very effective in helping them uh raise their next round. We went into that deal alone. We wrote the very first check the very first institutional check. And then within seven months brought, brought in sort of Sequoia, Canaan and Tribeca Capital. Uh, in the case of Optimal Dynamics, which is one of the most successful tech spin outs out of Princeton, uh, we were looking at that opportunity with a couple of other larger venture funds. They ended up wanting to wait to see more traction. And by that point, we'd been meeting with Danny and the team for over a year. And we said, you know what, we have enough conviction. And again, we wrote the first 
institutional check in that opportunity. And it's turned out to be a very, very successful uh, opportunity uh, deal for us. Uh, next slide. And uh, this slide just shows you sort of when we go in alone or when we go in early, uh, I think it's important to recognize that that's good, but companies are only successful if they can continue to raise capital from other venture capitalists. And so this is a list of some of the firms that have followed us and invested in the later rounds of some of our portfolio companies. Uh, everybody from Liberty Media to uh, Coke Disruptive Technologies and, and some of the other names here. And so this shows you that the companies that we've been investing in are attractive, not just to us, but to other um, leading VCs. And of course, that's critical to, to continue to grow the companies. Next slide. All I'll right. Turn it over to you, Mark. All right, great. Thank you, Jim. Um, and as Jim mentioned, if anyone, we're, we're going to go through this pretty quickly, um, and there's a lot of material. If you've got any questions, please just enter them into the Q&A. Uh, click the Q&A button, enter the questions there, and we'll try to get to some of those um, at the end of the presentation. So when we talk about financing startups, it's often we're talking about runway. And what that is, it's a time remaining for startups uh, to meet its startup to meet its milestones before it runs out of money uh, and needs to raise more money. And so when you're thinking about sources of funds for a startup, there are both non-dilutive options and dilutive options. And we're going to go through several of these. Typically, we would say, you know, you should startups should focus uh, on the non-dilutive options as long as they can uh, without um, damaging the growth prospect of the company. And then when they need uh, to raise money uh, and from these other groups and dilutive options, uh, those are, of course, important to continue the growth of the company. So looking at the non, some of the non-dilutive options, bootstrapping, which just means um, uh, that it's you're building the company and, and using money that either the founders themselves have put into the company or generated out of internal cash flows of the company. And you know, one really good example that the Gemini like to use is a company out of the Princeton ecosystem, founded by an, an undergraduate alum named uh, Andrew Giant, a company called Wiseant that uh, was a tutoring company uh, that uh, he and his partner bootstrapped for. A number of years, at least five years, and, and got up to tens of millions of dollars in revenue before they raised their first dollar of outside capital. Uh, and the reason they did that uh, was that they could maintain ownership of the company um, uh, and, and more control of the company for longer. And they raised the money only when they had a, a particular need for it, which was to expand into online tutoring. And the company ended up raising. Uh, a good amount of money and then exiting the company at a, at a very high valuation later. And uh, it was a good, uh, good experience, I think, for the founders. Um, another source of non-dilutive funding are bank loans, which presumably everyone is, is uh, familiar with. It's bank loans are pretty unusual for startups, for especially at the very early stage, because banks only want to lend against cash flow or assets. And typically a startup would have neither. Um, they're even more rare now with the, uh, blow up of Silicon Valley Bank a couple of weeks ago, which was nearly traumatic for a lot of us in the industry. Um, another source of non-dilutive uh, financing for startup are government grants. And I suspect uh, that many of the grad student um, alums and, and uh, grad students uh, on this call know more about government grants than Jim or I do, but um, but they're very valuable, uh, especially in early stage for tech heavy startups. Uh, which hopefully many of you are, are considering starting or have started. Um, government grants can typically only be used for R&D, research and development purposes, and not for commercialization purposes. So it's not useful um, for marketing or sales, but especially at an early stage of a tech-heavy company, it's important and a very good source of non-dilutive capital for uh, tech-heavy startups. And then so when... People think about raising money for startups. They typically are thinking about equity, um, selling equity in the company. It's the main source of, of cash and fundraising for growth-oriented uh, startups. Uh, and the reason an investor would invest in a startup, an outside person would invest in a startup, is because they want to generate outsized returns for taking on um, um, additional risk. Yeah, if, if an investor wanted to just earn 5%, they can invest in treasury bills, but they want to generate higher returns than that. And so they may invest in a, a startup and 
they may be trying to generate, you know, a hundred times their, their money. And there we're, we're, we'll talk just briefly about several sort of instruments used to invest in types of invest equity investment in companies. Uh, convertible notes would be the first. And despite the name and despite sort of the implication that it's debt, and, and there is a debt component of convertible notes. They have a term. It's a, it's a, technically a loan a, and has a term of 12 to 24 months and an interest rate. Um, it's really an equity instrument, at least in the eyes of most outside investors, because they want the notes to convert into equity, it, it, from, especially from a, a venture capital or, or professional investor standpoint. If a convertible note went to maturity and were repaid by the startup, that would be we would consider that to be a, a failure. So a convertible note is like a loan, except that it converts into equity under certain circumstances, um, primarily when the startup raises uh, an outside priced round, which would be issuing preferred equity in a, in a later in investment round. And then, then the convertible note that's accrued interest would convert into that equity at a discount, usually 20 to 25% of the price of that next round um, and with a cap. Um, there's a lot more to be can be said about this, but um, uh, just just everyone should know generally that convertible notes are often used by uh, startups to raise money uh, in their first first issuance. Another similar instrument is called a safe, and and many of you may be familiar with safes. It stands for Simple Agreement for Future Equity. This is uh, a construct created by Y Combinator, which is a big accelerator uh, that started on the West Coast. It's very similar to convertible debt, um, except it's really just a contract. It's not debt. It's, it doesn't take the form of debt on the balance sheet. There's no maturity date, no security interest, nothing. It's just a simple a, a contract to, that allows the investor to invest uh, in, and buy equity in the company in the future at a cap and uh, with a cap and a discount. Um, I'll, I'll just add one thing to that. Um, you know, we a lot of investors don't like them so much because they really because they don't show up. They're not really. You have to ask for them, so they're not on the balance sheet. They're not on the cap table, and they're basically like a quick and easy convertible note. But a lot of people think, I think mistakenly, that it is a lot easier than a convertible note, and frankly, it isn't today. Most law firms put the form of capital notes on their websites. You know, you can pull them down and use them. Um, they're very simple. I mean, the argument used to be for a safe that it was just quicker and easier and saved you legal fees. I really don't think that's true anymore. And most savvy investors are going to want to invest in uh, in the convertible note instead of a safe. Right. Yep. Good point. Um, and, uh, and, and often people in, or startup founders want to use those notes, not only because they're notes or safes, because they're perceived as simpler to draft and and less legal time, um, but also because it defers the valuation discussion. So maybe the company is too early and the founder doesn't really want to talk about valuation, how to value the company. But the reality is that when you set a cap, when an investor sets a cap uh, by which the, the note or safe is going to convert into the next round of equity, that's basically a proxy for evaluation. So um, anyway, we and, and many other investors are, are pretty negative on safes in particular and, and prefer preferred equity issuances to notes as well. All right, so speaking of which, uh, preferred stock. Uh, so this would be the security of choice that would be issued uh, in to venture capitalists and many other outside investors. So preferred stock, when, when people think about stock, they usually are thinking about common stock, which is what's owned by the founders and employees of the company. And preferred stock is what's sold to outside investors like venture capitalists or angel investors sometimes. Uh, and it's called preferred stock because it gets paid in preference to the common stock. So when the company sells or liquidates for whatever reason, the preferred investors, outside investors get paid first, and then uh, the common shareholders get paid. Um, and issuing preferred stock does set the valuation of the company, which is a, you know, should be considered as a, a plus, uh, or it's certainly considered as a plus for outside investors and, and can be for the founders as well. Um, Preferred stock and the flavors of it are can be very complex, and so uh, we often we we always tell uh, startup founders you should hire an attorney early on to make sure you get all the intellectual property transfer in the case of of um, 
uh, grad students or professors, um, <clears throat> correct, but also just a set, setup of the company. Um, and especially when the company goes to issue any kind of security, whether it's a convertible note, a safe, or an especially preferred stock, you need to have a good attorney. And this is an area you don't want to skimp. Yeah, I would just add, um, you know, even convertible notes, uh, those are fine early on, but I would advise all founders to be careful how much you issue under convertible notes and or safes, because you see it frequently where they just keep sort of casually ex uh, increasing the amount of capital they're raising. And what ultimately happens without getting into all the details is if you have too much debt outstanding on these convertible notes or safes, when you later go to issue your preferred stock round, what ends up happening is if that valuation isn't high enough, the people who end up getting squeezed in terms of how much equity they end up owning is the founding team. And so we as investors never want to see that. And so I think it's fine to think about in broad strokes raising, oh, a few million dollars under either convertible notes or safes. But once you get beyond that, you really want to have somebody price the round. Yep. Yep. Good point. Um. Okay, so looking at types of equity investors, um, the first would be friends and family. Uh, we and, and most investors, institutional investors, like to see a friends and family have invested in a startup because it creates skin in the game for the startup founder. Um, so, you know, if if a startup founder is taking money from grandma, they're much less likely to, you know, cast aside and just leave the startup and, and abandon, <laughs> abandon the startup and, and lose all grandma's money. So having that kind of uh, investment from friends and family, even if it's not a lot of money, if, if even if the founder doesn't come from a wealthy family, just a little bit so that they have that commitment from uh, from their family to to the startup is, is important. But you have to be aware that it can create conflicts uh, anytime you mix family and, and, uh, and, and money. Um, the next type of uh, equity investor would be angel investors. These are typically high net worth individuals um, who uh, invest at very early stage, usually with friends and family or, or immediately afterwards. Um, angel investors typically invest. Uh, they don't do much diligence. Uh, they go to a pitch comp, a pitch night usually, and then hear uh, a pitch, do a little bit of time of diligence, and then invest. Um, so usually they would be interested in investing under simple structures like a convertible note or a safe. Um, and, uh, and examples are AngelList, uh, the Princeton Alumni Angels is a, is a very good, uh, active angel group, um, that invests in lots of startups. Our caution here would be that sometimes angel investors, because maybe they don't see that many investments in companies that they're considering investing in, um, and they're not interested in, in negotiating, having lengthy negotiations may agree to a higher valuation. But that can cause you problems as a startup founder. That can cause you problems down the road um, if you raise money at too high a valuation, and later investors come in and and want to invest at a lower valuation. Uh, third type of uh, equity investors, strategic investors. So this would be a company that's in uh, usually a company that's in your industry. Uh, that can be great, and it can be certainly gratifying to a founder to get the interests of a, a big company in their industry. Uh, in investing in their company and, and good validation from that perspective, but it can cause problems later on if uh, you, the founder, give the strategic investor too many rights, like a right to information even, a right to a board seat, a right to buy the company at some future date on future terms. Those can be really damaging uh, to future fundraises and future sales of the company. So you exercise a lot of caution before you take money from a strategic investor. And then the last uh, type of investor is uh, venture capital. We'll talk a little bit more about that. All right, so venture capital gets a lot of popular focus. Um, so when newspaper articles are written about startups, I usually talk about venture capital at the same time. And it is a really important source of money for startups, uh, high growth startups, primarily because um, because venture capitalists do a lot of due diligence and have a lot of uh, see a lot of different companies, when a venture capital firm does make an investment, it's a good validating signal to the marketplace that this is a good startup worthy of tracking and, and maybe for, for other investors uh, investing in the future and for customers um, that this is a serious startup that's got um, material backing. Um, 
It also, venture capitalists, typically it would be viewed as de-risking the company a little bit because, as I said, they do due diligence. And so they're looking at looking for problems. And also because in the venture capitalists will usually get involved uh, in the startup and have a lot of expertise advising startups, if not running startups outright uh, in their in their backgrounds. And so they can pr- pr- help startup founders, especially um, first time founders uh, learn instead of learning on the job, let them help them get over some of the early hurdles uh, that the, the venture capital firm has already uh, seen in other portfolio companies. Um, I guess one other thing to point out here is that venture capitalists, it is an expensive uh, has a, it's a high cost of capital. It's an expensive form of capital because venture capitalists, when they invest, they want to target, at least at the early stage, they want to target at least a 10-time return on their money. And so, for instance, Jim said Fitzgate invests typically $500,000 in the first for, in our first investment. So we want to be able to see a pathway to generating, turning that $500,000 into $5 million. And so that typically means that the company that we're investing in is in, in other venture firms would be high growth and capital efficient. And also uh, there's this concept of game of outliers. So typically a startup that is going to be able to grow that fast and that capital efficiently has some kind of superpower. It is an outlier in some way. Uh, Venture firms typically don't invest in startups just because they check all the boxes. Typically they they invest because uh, they have some kind of competitive advantage, which we we think is going to allow them to be ultra successful. Yeah, I would just add, you know, we always point out to a lot of founders where you can have a wildly successful business as an entrepreneur and never raise a penny of venture capital. So you need to think critically about whether you really are the right kind of company to even try to raise venture capital because it it, it really is only appropriate for very, very high growth companies. And, you know, there, there are ways to create intergenerational wealth uh, without raising a penny of venture capital. So it doesn't mean that you can't be successful if you don't raise venture. It's just that certain companies lend themselves to requiring venture and others don't. Yep. Yep. Okay. So what do VCs look for? We've talked about this a little bit, looking for that sort of key characteristic that's going to allow them to be successful, uh, that sort of outlier outlier. Um, but generally, uh, venture capitalists want, are looking for companies that are um, very capital efficient, can grow very fast, and can generate that 10x plus return in a relatively short period of time. Usually that means six to seven years. Um, not to get into the weeds too much, but venture capital firms typically have a 10-year life with uh, a few extensions. And so depending upon when the venture firm makes its first investment, uh, in the company, they they want to be able to exit the company either by an IPO or the company sells itself within you know six seven years something in that range. Um, and specifically, what are VCs looking for? Looking at they're typically looking primarily at at an early stage at the management team. Um, does the management team do they have? Um, well, J- Jim is going to talk more about that later. But but w- w- the key characteristics of the management team prior success. Um, do they have the the resiliency and, and fortitude and expertise to to pursue and be successful in the in the industry they've targeted? Um, and the business model is is it, are they is the it can be a great management team, but if they're targeting a small market um, that's declining in value, then that's you know that's that's they're they're not going to be they're probably not going to be successful. So you want to be targeting a large and growing market. Uh, with the management team that has expertise in that market. Hey, I would just add one thing, you know, just just so to, to be clear, when we talk about venture capital returns, we are talking about early stage, seed stage VCs like ourselves that are requiring this 10X return. But as the companies mature and raise a series A, a series B and series C, you'll find venture capital firms investing in those later rounds and they will not require a 10x return. For example, at the C level, it might be a three to four X they're looking for. And that's appropriate because the company has been significantly de-risked by the time you get to that phase. So the reason why seed stage investors want 10x isn't because they're greedy. It's because if you model out traditional returns, probably a third of a venture capital firm's uh, investments are going to fail at the seed stage. And then when you look at, let's say, a seed, uh, a Series C fund, uh, they're not going to have that same failure rate because the companies have been de-risked significantly. Yep. Yep. Good point. Um, okay. 
All right. So zooming out, um, when you're thinking about what kind of company you are, you have, and what uh, and where you're going to raise money uh, to help grow the company, uh, I find this this quadrant to be useful. On the y-axis, there is the capital required uh, to build the company and reach cash flow positive. On the x-axis, is novelty of the technology or the business model. Um, and so, as we talked about earlier, most companies um, in the world. Uh, fall into this sort of small business, low novelty, low capital requirements. Many of those businesses can be wildly successful and, as Jim mentioned, create intergenerational wealth, but they're not appropriate for outside investors. Usually those would be funded by personal credit and bank loans as the company grows. Um, another uh, type of business that would be capital intensive, but low in novelty um, because they're building something with a proven technology, kind of like maybe think about building an apartment building or a manufacturing facility. Those would be, again, outside investment would typically take the form of uh, debt, um, project finance, commercial banks, maybe a strategic investor to help uh, those companies grow. So when you're thinking about companies that are high in novelty, there are some that would fall into this sort of capital intensive uh, area. And those would be things like quantum computing, which we've invested in, or therapeutics, like a, building a cure for cancer, or a, a drug uh, therapeutic. Those are capital intensive new technologies. They are novel um, and, they're diff and they're usually difficult to fund. You, you typically have to have a specialty investor that will invest in those kind of companies. So a, a fund, for instance, that focuses on pharmaceuticals. Um, also, government, uh, especially if it's something that's that's important for national security, can uh, can can be good sources of of capital for those kind of companies. The ones the com companies that are appropriate for venture capital are those that are both high novelty and low capital requirements, and that is the realm of venture capital, and that's and, and angel investors, and that's a very small percentage of the overall startups. In the, in the world. Okay, so that's it for uh, a very brief and high level introduction uh, of startup finance. I'll turn it over to Jim to talk about uh, pitch deck requirements. Yeah, and if any of that seemed like we were going fast, just, just keep in mind what Mark just covered is an entire semester at a business school or you know undergraduate class. So we uh, we covered a lot of a lot of information there. So this this last part of our presentation, I think, is is helpful for those of you who are thinking about being an entrepreneur or who are an entrepreneur. And Mark and I see oh, thousands of decks each year, and even from sophisticated uh, founders and entrepreneurs, it's it's kind of amazing how the decks generally. Um, are very different in many ways. And I think sometimes when you're too close to something, you forget about very basic fundamentals. And so as a founder, we'll start with what you should have ready if, for example, you want to at least, they call it socialize the idea of your startup with investors. You should have always have a, a quick elevator pitch. It should be something, if you're going to send an email, here's our advice. If you're going to send an email to someone asking if they'd like to talk to you about your startup, one paragraph, two or three sentences max. You know, if we see an email with uh, you know multiple paragraphs, it's usually not going to get read. So, you need to be able to describe your startup, the problem, and the solution in two sentences. And that means when you're at a conference like this or at a cocktail party, you need to be able to articulate it very quickly. Then, if someone says, "Hey, that's interesting," you should have a pitch deck ready, and that's what we're going to cover in the rest of this presentation. Is sort of what you should put in there. But then typically what Mark will ask for at the same time, we say, hey, send us your pitch deck before we have a call. Um, we like what you told us in that little blurb. Send us your deck. We'll also say, send us your financial projections, financial model, and your cap table. And when we say financial model, we don't mean some detailed investment banking type model. We mean really directionally show us how you expect this company to grow over the next three to five years. Because occasionally we'll see one that has, let's say, year five revenue of $10 million. Well, if you just do basic math on the back of an envelope, you realize very quickly that isn't scaling quickly enough to be a venture capital back opportunity. And so it's important to just get an idea uh, of where you think this company is going to go in the next three to five years, even though no one's going to hold you to it. And the cap table just shows how it's owned. That's a fancy word for who owns the equity. Okay, next slide, Mark. So... These are really, we're going to go through each of the elements of a pitch deck. 
And I think it's important to start out, don't get in the weeds, don't get in the market size. The first thing you need to say in your deck is, what's the problem you're solving and what's your solution? Because we see a lot of decks where you're looking through, you're your page five and you're like, I don't even know what, what the company does yet, <laughs> you know? And so that's uh, really basic, but make sure you say that. So it's the problem and then what's the solution? And then I'd go to the team. Uh, you know, we one thing that I forgot to mention earlier when Mark was talking about financing, there are investors who only look at the team at our stage, you know, um, and there are others who only will look at it if it's a, if it's it has the ability to return the entire fund, not even just 10x, but more like a 50x. Um, but the team is very important. Um, the average age of a successful founder is demographically somewhere in their 40s. It's not to say you don't have the uh, the odd one-off Zuckerberg periodically coming off a college campus. I think uh, PhDs, for example, are very attractive founders to back because they have such deep domain expertise. Um, but the team is the first thing. So describe your team, what your backgrounds are, um, if you've been in the industry before, if you've experienced the, the, the problem you're trying to solve you, you know, before. And then, you know, how much you've invested personally or how much you own personally. And we talk about vesting schedules. That's just, you know, when you own your equity, um, you know, do you own it all right now or will you own it over a period of years? Um, and then we, we broadly define the opportunity as what is the opportunity here? You know, yes, there's a problem to be solved, but how big is the market? The market has to be big enough so that you can scale quickly, you know, just it's sort of, you can't grow very quickly. You can't grow very big if the, if the market size itself isn't big enough. So who's the customer? Um, what's the problem and who's the customer who would buy? Okay. Next slide, Mark. I did just want one point on uh, going, going back a little bit up on the vesting schedules, especially for first time founders. Um, institutional investors like venture capital, venture capital firms will typically ask founders to reverse vest their equity. So, you know, it, it can be, that can be a shocking <laughs> uh, experience for a first time founder for someone to come in and say, okay, you don't actually own your equity anymore. We want you to, it to vest over time. And the reason is that, uh, and we've seen it, um, that you don't want to have a founder leave the company and take all their equity with them. And then uh, and, and so the remaining founders and employees have to build the company with a sort of a, a, a dead space on their cap table from, from a former employee or, or founder who is no longer there and no longer pulling on the oars to try to make the company successful. So that's yeah. very, very common to have that kind of reverse vesting. Yeah. And one thing I will say, since maybe a lot of the audience here is PhD um, students or, or grads or postdocs, is um, one, um, you know, this missionary versus mercenary. We do like to see people who've experienced the problem directly themselves as founders. Not to say you couldn't be a mercenary, meaning somebody who has experience and just identifies a problem they haven't necessarily uh, encountered directly themselves in their own work experience. But when we think about co-founders, I think there's a tendency, if you're a, if you're a founder and you have a good idea, you feel the need that you must have a co-founder. And a co-founder is a good idea. But particularly when you're young, it's very um, it's very difficult to find that right person. And so when we see co-founders, it's not always a 50-50 split. You know, if this is your idea, you're licensing something, let's say, out of the lab from a university campus, and you decide maybe you are you're the technical person, um, but you need a marketing person. Um, you know, you could you could allocate maybe a 10% ownership stake to somebody like that call them a co-founder, um, but you still control the company. And so there are lots of different permutations as to how you can divvy up the capital. It's not always a 50-50 deal. And all I would say is be very cautious in who you pick to be your co-founders, because unless you've known them for you know, a decade, it, it, it's very difficult to make assessments uh, early on as you're getting to know people. And that's why, to Mark's point, you want to have vesting schedules in case you know somebody falls out of the management team, they don't leave your cap table stranded. Okay. Um, so then the next thing you want to cover in your deck in a lot of detail is what's your business model? You know, And that's just a fancy way of saying, how are you going to generate revenue? How are you going to price your product? What's your margin? How much will it cost you to acquire a customer? You know, Who is your customer? CAC is uh, sort of a fancy... Uh, acronym for just mean, it just means customer acquisition cost. But it's really important to know this, to go into this granular, granular level of detail to know um, who your customer is, 
how much it's going to cost you to get that customer, and then make some estimate of what's the lifetime value of that customer. How much would you expect that customer to generate in revenue over, over their lifetime of doing business with you uh, as a business? Um, and then, uh, you know, how long is the sales cycle? So these things all play, there's a, there's a lot of interaction between these things. We've seen a lot of great startups that have a fantastic product but the sales cycle, because let's say in a cybersecurity deal, you have to, uh, if it's if, if it's a expensive product, you have to sell to a CTO at a company or a very senior level company, uh, senior level at that company. That can take six months, twelve months, and that's not fatal. But if you do secure the sale, you better make sure you're generating enough revenue from that sale. So there's uh, there's a lot of tension between your pricing and who has to approve it, um, but make sure you understand all those things. And then the other thing is really understand who your customer is, particularly for this audience. I think um, iCore is a great example. Mark Mark is involved in that, um, and I think one of the things they do that I think is fantastic is this whole notion of customer discovery very early on. You know, make sure you talk to fifty or a hundred people to see if this problem you think you're solving needs to be solved. Uh, we've seen plenty of startups where uh, founders have spent a couple of years developing the best product, and then they go out to talk to a customer for the very first time, and they find out, ooh, nobody really cares about this problem. <laughs> so I think it's really important to talk to those customers early on. Uh, next slide. Yeah, and just, just one thing to add is that yeah, uh, for for most decks that we see uh, and from, from startup founders uh, who are grad students or not, uh, the number one thing that's missing in those decks is a cogent, a coherent go-to-market strategy. That's something that so many, I mean, two-thirds of founders maybe uh, just don't focus enough attention on. They they have this idea that if they have a great product, they build it, that, you know, the customers will just come. And that is very, very rarely true. So you have, so we, I would advise you give some serious thought uh, before you go out to raise money from anyone about how you're, if you've got this great product, how are you going to get it in front of customers and convince them to buy? Good point. So the other thing to really understand is at least when we look at DEX is does this founder really know the market? Do they understand who their competition is? Um, and that includes public and private companies. And if they're private, make sure you understand who funded them, how much funding they have, um, what's your competitive advantage versus these companies? Do you have any kind of moat or defensible defensible IP? Um, and it's not fatal if there's a company or several companies in your space that are competing with you. In fact, that can be good because it's a market validation. It means there is a problem and other people are addressing it. So, you know, you can either be the first mover in a space or you can be a fast follower. Oftentimes, the fast follower um, is more successful. Then when we get to the product and the technology, you know, you need to describe what is it that the product does? Um, you know, what stage is your product in? There's some terminology here, you know, is it an alpha beta? You know, basically, you know, alpha is early. You're sort of sharing it with people friendly to the firm. The beta is more of a test going out to other potential customers and, and really refining it. And then before you really go to market, you might do a few pilot uh, contracts with some customers that would then ultimately convert into longer term uh, permanent contracts. Um, but describe the product. Can it be produced at scale? What are your margins? How's it? Get, how do you, you know, if it's software, it's one thing, but if it's hardware, you know, you have to really be prepared to describe what does it cost to make this product? You know, are the margins even feasible? Um, what's your strategy? What's the timing? Next slide. And then something, you know, depends, obviously, with respect to therapeutics, you know, FDA approvals are an obvious one, but are there other regulatory considerations that you need to be familiar with? Make sure, you know, for example, we just invested in a really cool company that does coatings. Uh, one of the things they're coating is frozen food boxes. And so it's, it is an approval process with the FDA. It's a different kind of approval, but you have to go through an approval process. It's really important to make sure that you're familiar with what kind of approvals your product's going to require, uh, because you certainly don't want to be caught flat-footed when you're approaching your investors about that point. And intellectual property for this audience, probably very important. Um, you know, if you're spinning something out of a university campus, you're prob probably licensing IP 
But I would say this, that uh, for most startups, IP can be very uh, valuable. Uh, it can be a defensible, you know, uh, competitive advantage, but it's by no means required. You know, um, I think it's very attractive when you ultimately go to get acquired, for example, that, you know, the buyer can check that box that you have IP. On the other hand, don't think that it makes you bulletproof just because you have a patent doesn't mean that somebody's not going to copy it. And somebody might not care about copying it because they realize, oh, you've only raised $3 million. Well, I'll just let them sue me and I'll probably win because I'm much bigger. So I would just say that IP is important, but really the key to all startups is execution ability. You know, don't, don't hide behind your IP uh, while it's still important to have. And then capitalization, you just should describe in your deck that's a fancy word of for like how much money have you raised and from whom? You know, have you raised uh, angel money? Have you put your own money in? Have you raised uh, uh, convertible debt, a safe? Uh, just make sure you're clear about how much money you've raised, how much is left, uh, how much runway you have to Mark's point, how many more months of operating uh, capital do you have? And then go into the current round. How much are you raising and why? So why are you raising money? What are the use of proceeds? Meaning, what will you use it for? And then basically, um, how many months will this last you? So you'll get into things like your burn rate. And when will when you hit the end of that runway, what milestones will you have achieved that will make it possible for you to raise your next round of capital? That's usually, some, you know, from, from our position, yeah, that's usually... Um, you know, a, a revenue milestone in terms of a monthly recurring revenue figure. Um, so when you think about setting the terms, if you're talking about how much you're raising, if you're raising money from angels via safe or, or convertible note, um, it's okay to set the valuation or the cap, as we said before. Um, but if you're raising institutional money, uh, the savvy thing to do is to say, I don't know the terms yet. I'm putting it out there for investors and waiting for term sheets. If you try and send your deck to a, to a venture capital fund and say the valuation is X, um, I mean, it might be directionally interesting to them to see what you're thinking, but ultimately they're going to set the terms. And so I think you'll come across as a little more sophisticated if you just say, Terms TBD, waiting for a term sheet. Um, the other thing you should be prepared for, um, you know, if you're raising angel money, uh, you know, you really, or friends and family money, you don't really have to worry too much about your board at that point. I think it's perfectly fine for you to be the sole board member. Uh, even some deals we've invested in, in the pre-seed rounds and even seed rounds, the board is composed of really the founder and we're board observers. Um, but that's something you should start thinking about when you take an institutional money at the seed stage, typically the investor will join your board. And then ultimately it'll probably be you and the found you as the founder, maybe your co-founder and ultimately, um, an independent director. Uh, next slide. So the other thing to put in your deck is this very brief financial forecast. Have a maybe a more detailed version, you know, in your back pocket for due diligence, but in your deck, I would have at least one slide that shows how quickly your top line. You don't have to. Don't worry about cash flow at this point. Um, you know you're going to probably be cash flow negative for a while as you reinvest all your money to growth. But I think directionally, it's important for your investors to see what's your year one revenue, year two, year three, year four, year five. Just directionally, how you how you're thinking about it. Um, there's probably never been a forecast that's been accurate. Um, but in the history of startups, but so I wouldn't go too crazy, but I also would be, um, you know, you want to be confident and you want to be uh, clear that this requires capital to grow at these rates. And then it's very important at the, at the tail end of your deck, talk about your exit options, you know, because if you're not thinking about liquidity, uh, your investor isn't going to want to give you money. As Mark said, all venture capital funds, whatever stage, are typically 10 year terms and they're looking, you know, we're very patient investors. You know, we can wait five to 10 years, but at some point we have to generate a return for our own investors. And so it's important for us to see that the founder has thought about how am I going to generate liquidity for my investors? And it's not going to be in the form of a dividend. It's going to be the form of either an IPO or a strategic sale. And so you should be conversing in who are the potential buyers for my company? At what stage? How big will I have to be to be attractive to them? And on the other side is if you're thinking about an IPO, how big do I need to be to go public? And so you should be conversant in comparable companies that are already public that are doing something similar to what you're doing. Uh, next slide. 
So this is just kind of a cheat sheet. I think we can skip through this, Mark, and and maybe Eva, if we uh, if there are any questions, we could we could answer a few before we go. Well, ab absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Jim and Mark. We're so fortunate to have both of you leading our learning cohort for graduate students, um, and really grateful that we were able to give the forum audience a taste of that program through this, this session today. I know uh, they learned quite a lot. We we do have uh, one audience member question teed up already, and I'll go ahead and read that. <clears throat> you mentioned that PhDs can make good founders because of deep content expertise. Can you please give an example of PhD founders, perhaps one from the sciences and one from the humanities and social sciences, since often science and engineering is what comes top of mind when we think of entrepreneurship. Well, sure, I'll, I'll start. Um, so one PhD founder, just straight from our portfolio and from Princeton is, uh, uh, we mentioned the company Optical Dynamics. So it was a spin out of the Orphe department that was founded by Professor Warren Powell and several, and his son, Danny Powell and several uh, grad student and postdocs, uh, PhDs in his lab um, in the Orphe department, including Juliana Nascimento. Um, and uh, they've been very successful. Um, Professor Powell did not leave the university, but he's remained uh, active in the company. And then he retired a couple of years ago and now is an advisor to the company. But the PhDs, the postdocs and grad students, many of whom left Princeton, joined the startup, including Juliana, and, uh, and have, have found great jobs and done a great, great job at the company. Um, Jim, in terms of humanity, social science uh, founders, uh, we've I mean, seen a few. Like, yeah, I can't, I can't remember the name of the company in particular, but there was one where, you know, it was more public policy oriented, and it was a way to um, scrape data from the dark web to see. Remember that one, Mark? I can't remember what it was called, but we've had in our cohort. I mean, obviously, I think it's no surprise that these skew towards uh, deep tech, hard tech. The, the the sciences, computer science, um, you know, biotech. Uh, there's a lot going on with the gut biome and students who want to study that. But there are, it's not to say you can't be a social scientist and have a startup. You know, if you go out into the real world, there are a lot of problems uh, being solved by um, uh, in the social sciences. I mean, one of our companies, Predata, you know, Jim Shin, who uh, taught at Princeton for years, um, was one of the co-founders of a company called Predata, which was basically... Uh, scraping public sources for what they called anticipatory intelligence. So mm -hmm. helping the State Department figure out risks internationally based on chatter on social media sites. Mm -hmm. At least that was the origins of that company. I think it employed about 15 Princetonians at one point, uh, many of whom I think were graduate students uh, or graduate alums. And, and ultimately that company got bought by another Princeton run company called Fiscal Note that recently went public. So um, there are plenty of plenty of examples on both sides of the equation, and um, I think the key thing is if uh, you know d don't feel the need that you need to start a company right away when you're coming you know out of your own educational experience. It's okay to go out and maybe test the waters working for somebody else because you know I do think it's important to either have some business experience yourself or partner with someone who has because there's a lot more than the IP as we've said before to executing on a business plan. Yeah, I, I, just a couple other specific examples I was thinking about uh, in the humanity social science. I, I don't know if they had a PhD, but Stuart Butterfield uh, was a, had a, I think a master's in philosophy from Yale and he was a founder of Slack. Um, he did pretty well. We, yeah, he did that, that one did pretty well. Uh, and then in our own portfolio company, again, not PhDs, but advanced degrees, um, the founders of NewsGuard, which is an anti-misinformation company um, that, is, that is doing really, really well. Um, and they basically, it's a former um, founder of American Legal Media, a media company, and a former publisher of the Wall Street Journal. Um, both of them advanced degrees, like I said, I think maybe one of them has a PhD, but uh, they basically founded a company that researches sources of misinformation and, publish, and publishes that, and it's useful for advertisers and, and for the government, U.S. government. Um, and it looked like there's one more question. Do we have time for it? Yeah, yeah. And and um, 
for for those that are are interested, we also have uh, another uh, humanities group of uh, Princeton PhDs uh, that founded Project Plastic, um, and they were architecture students that came through the Techstars Bootcamp uh, that we partnered on a few years ago. I, if there's also maybe a moment before we get to that final question for you all to describe your role in these boot camps, um, you know, both Jim and Mark have served as mentors and also judges in terms of the the boot camp. So what does that for a graduate student who may not have registered for these boot camps? What what can they expect in the way of that experience? Well, uh, if you're if you're talking about the eLab, the Keller Center? Yeah, and the, okay. Mm -hmm. Um yeah, so so that uh the Keller Center every summer runs um an e-lab program, uh, boot camps for uh, startups, uh, and I think they provide stipends. Um, and that has been a valuable um, program for many startup founders who talk to, helping them really get off the ground. So it's it's companies that are at almost ideation phase and getting them uh, so they can put together a business plan. Um, uh, and then if you're talking about i core um, i, -Core, I, I as Jim had mentioned before, I think is a really valuable program in helping, especially technical founders like many of the grad students here, think through uh, the, their, their customers and their customer needs. Who's going to buy their product? Is there, is there an actual need? Are they going to, is the customer going to buy it? And how much would they pay? I think that's really an invaluable um, knowledge base to have as a, as a startup founder. And as you progress down sort of the life cycle of the from boot camp to let's say accelerator or incubator, I'm sure everybody who is you know paying attention today realizes there are probably hundreds of accelerators and incubators out there. And all I would say on that is it can be very, very helpful to you as a founder, mm -hmm. but definitely view them very critically to see what value they're going to bring to you because they do take in for most of them, they do take a significant equity stake, call it six percent. They may give you a small amount of capital for that. And, um, you know, everybody from YC to tech stars to others, there are a bunch of, you know, people have never even heard of. I think they can be very helpful, but just, just keep in mind, you are giving up a big slug of your company at a very early stage. And so make sure you're going to get value for that. Yeah. Well, I, I think those are words to, to close us out. Thank you again, Jim and Mark, for all that you do and continue to do to educate, mentor, and inspire current and future generations of Princeton entrepreneurs. Uh, join uh, for our audience, uh, please stay tuned. Our next session on how to identify, apply for, and win grants and fellowships will begin in just a few moments. Thank you again, folks.